welcome you all for coming out tonight. Um, I'm Barbara Sharkey. I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of Queen Anne's County. Um, this is the forum for the candidates for the Maryland House of Delegates, District 36. When you go to the polls and you vote, you will be able to vote for up to three candidates, but only uh, no more than one per county. So I just want to say a few notes about um, tonight's scheduled forum. Originally, we had set up a forum for the state senator between Senator Steve Hershey and Ms. Heather Sinclair, which would follow this forum. Recently, Senator Hershey's campaign notified us he would not be able to participate after all, which meant we had to cancel the forum. Um, our rules are that we have to have at least one opponent um, and must take part in order to have a forum. Heather Sinclair had said she was going to be here tonight, but I don't see her in the audience. Um, but if she does come, she was willing to stay after this forum is over and just talk informally with anyone that was interested in asking her some questions. So this forum is presented by the Kent, Midshore, and Queen Anne's County leagues. Um, Midshore is Talbot, Caroline, and Dorchester counties. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that promotes political responsibility through informed and active participation of citizens in their government. And as I said, to maintain our nonprofit status, the League of Women Voters presents forums only with candidates who have at least one opponent running and also participating in the same forum. So before we get started tonight, I just wanted to point out two things. First of all, the League of Women Voters guide is being printed for, the, for this election as we speak and will be distributed the week of October 14th in local newspapers, including the Star Democrat, the Bay Times, and the Record Observer. For those of you who don't know what the Voter's Guide is, this is what we distributed for the primary election. In it is every office that you will see on the ballot with an explanation of what the office does and is, how much they get paid, how often do they need to be reelected, and everyone who is a candidate for that office has answered questions and they are printed in this voter's guide. So if you don't get it in the newspaper, it also will be available in the libraries, the, the um, Center, Centerville Library and Kent Island Library, probably Kent County Library and Talbot Library. We try and get them out to the libraries. Also, if, um, if you don't want to wait to get the printed, you can look online to vote411.org. And um, that is a great resource for you. It will have your voter's guide information. You'll be able to look up what you're, how you are actually registered right now as a voter in the voter registration system. Um, it's good to look it up and make sure they've got your right address and everything is, is correct. And then if, it's, if you find there's a mistake, you, it'll give you an opportunity to go in and fix it right online. So, okay. Um, I also want to tell you about another forum that we've had to cancel, which is the one next Wednesday evening. We were going to have a forum for the Board of Education, Queen Anne's County Board of Education, um, candidates who are at-large candidates. And um, prior to that, just before um, that forum took place, we were going to have a meet and greet for the judges of the Orphans Court. We were just recently notified yesterday and today that um, enough of those people who had said they were going to take part now find that they have conflicts and they have all backed out. So those are canceled. All right. Um, but we do have some future forums coming up. And um, on the table in, at the outside there is a list. We have. Th um, 
a forum on Monday, October 15th, which is going to be Queen Anne's County Commissioners. They have all said they are taking part in that, so it should be, um, and it's gonna be at the um, Queen Anne's County Planning and Zoning Office, right across from the ACME in Centerville. And then on Sunday, October 21st, is the forum that is um, U.S. District 1 House of Representatives. Now that's gonna be taking place in Talbot County and at the um, Talbot County Library, 100 West Dover Street, Easton, um, and that is two o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. So pick up one of these flyers or um, you know, make a note of it, but those will hopefully go on. Okay, so let's get on to our forum for tonight. I'm going to introduce our moderator. It's Ms. Gwyn Schultz, Gwyn. And um, Gwyn is one of the founding members of the Queen Anne's County League of Women Voters. She served on a steering committee before we even had a board of directors. She um, previously served as one of the past co-presidents and she and her husband have, resi have been residents of Queen Anne's County for 26 years. So Gwen is now gonna take over the forum and she will explain the rules and the expectations and how you can ask questions. Thank you. Gwen? Good. Hey, oh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm gonna start out by doing some quick introductions of the candidates up on the stage. And on your far left is um, Jeff Greist um, from Caroline County, followed by Michael Welker from Cecil County, We've got Jay Jacobs from Kent County, Stephen Arntz from Queen Anne's County, and Crystal Woodward from Queen Anne's County. So what I'll do is take a few minutes um, to you know, kind of review the guidelines um, for today, and um, we're going to, the, the form is divided into three sections. We're going to begin with the candidates' opening remarks. Next, we'll be having questions from the audience. And then finally, each of the candidates will ha have an opportunity for closing comments. And I'll explain the ground rules for each of those sections um, as we get closer to that time. But before we get started, just a couple reminders and is to make sure to turn off the bells and whistles on your cell phones. Um, and let's see. So we're going to start with the opening statements and each candidate will have two minutes. Um, we do have some timers who um, are ladies sitting in the front row here will be giving the candidates a timer and then also, also when you get up to do your questions, they'll also um, make sure to look at the folks with the timing, little placards there so that you can kind of keep track of what's, how long you'll be up here. Um, and then what we did was we had the candidates each pick a number to determine the order for both the opening statement and then we'll be going the reverse order for the closing statements. So at this time, what I'll do is invite Krista Woodward, um, the first one to give um, <coughs> opening comments, and then we'll circle around to um, Mr. Greist and then the rest of our candidates. Thank you, Gwen. Uh, thanks to the League for hosting this forum. Thank you all for coming, and thanks to all the candidates for participating. Um, I'm honored and humbled to be here to participate tonight. I'm going to tell you just a little bit about me. I was born and raised in Dorchester County. My parents were small business owners. They owned a gas station on Route 50 in Cambridge. Um, my husband and I live on Kent Island. We have four grown children all have uh, graduated from college and are engaged with their professions. I am currently a master's degree uh, student at George Washington University. I'm pursuing a master's in paralegal studies, but I spend the bulk of my time working for the National Office of the American Diabetes Association in Crystal City, Virginia, where I started a program called Safe at School 20 years ago. And what that pro program does is it provides advocacy for children with diabetes in the school setting so that they are appropriately accommodated at school. Um, a bulk of my, a lot of my work um, is involved with training and educating healthcare professionals, parents, educators, 
uh, policymakers. I've spoken um, and educated all over the country, all over the world. Another part of my work is to work on the passage of legislation throughout the country to benefit these kids. And I've led the effort to pass legislation in 40 states, and one of those states was Maryland in 2016. Um, at work, in my professional life, I use a mantra and approach. It's educate, negotiate, legislate, and sometimes litigate. But we don't use litigate very much, um, thank goodness. Um, through my position at the association, I learned the importance of engaging stakeholders, collaboration, and compromise. Um, this is the same strategy that I'm going to use if I'm elected to office. I'm running for office to take care of working families. And by working families, what I mean is families who are working hard to make ends meet. Families um, who sometimes have to choose between buying a medication and paying their electric bill. Um, the same applies to our seniors who are faced with outrageous bills for medical care and medication. <laughs> families simply shouldn't have to make this choice. I advocate for a living wage, access to affordable health care, access to child care, access to affordable housing and post-secondary school. I always want to do what's right for the Eastern Shore and fight for ordinary Marylanders. I'm not accepting any PAC money or any special interest money. My campaign is completely funded by grassroots. I will not be, uh, be beholden to any special interest except the interest of the folks who elect me. Thanks again for this opportunity to be here with you all tonight. And I'll do the same. I want to thank the League for uh, sponsoring this event. We're glad to be here. Um, okay. And thank you all for coming out. It's obviously a very, very important part of um, the, uh, the democratic process to actually educate yourself and, and, and learn about the candidates and what they take and how they can, uh, how they can help you and, and your community as well. Um, I grew up in uh, Caroline County. I grew up on the Eastern Shore and uh, went to uh, North Carolina High School uh, where I met my wife. Um, and I do have two children. Uh, one's a uh, junior at North Carolina. The other's a freshman this year um, as well. I uh, attended uh, Chesapeake College uh, for two years here. Uh, played baseball and soccer, then went on to get a bachelor's degree in economics from Salisbury. Um, then it was Salisbury State. Sort of dating myself now. It's uh, Salisbury University. But, uh, and uh, I served uh, two terms, eight years as a county commissioner in Caroline County. And uh, the reason why I decided to run for delegate four years ago uh, was for two reasons. The first reason um, was that Caroline County didn't have any representation in Annapolis for over 20 years um, because of the way the district lines were drawn. It was basically nearly impossible for someone in Caroline County to get elected um, because the county's split and it's a rural county and they have to travel an hour and a half to get to the other end of the district. Um, and um, so I kind of put myself out there and then I decided to run and, 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 and was successful four years ago. And then the other reason why I decided to run is during those eight years as county commissioner, I felt like Caroline County and the entire Eastern Shore, I felt like that Annapolis didn't pay a whole lot of attention to them. And it's true. Um, and you know, even now, the Eastern Shore, we are a minority. It doesn't matter what party you come from. Um, we're still a minority in Annapolis. Um, and the people who are in charge are the folks who live in Montgomery County, Prince George's County, Baltimore City. They're the ones that are in their leadership, and they're the ones that are in, basically in control of what, how things happen. And I can tell you that over the first four years, I spent most of my time building relationships with folks who live in Montgomery County, Prince George's County, um, Baltimore City, and all across the state, because that's how you get things done. Um, and it's shown results. We brought back, I serve on the Appropriations Committee, um, and, and we brought back um, a lot of good money that are, it's going to good projects uh, right here on the Eastern Shore, right here in Queen Anne's County. So. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, thank you to the League of Women Voters for uh, putting this together. My name is Michael Welker, and I'm running for the House of Delegates. I come from Cecil County. Uh, specifically, I live in the town of Northeast, uh, right on the peninsula, the Elk Neck Peninsula. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm a historian. I'm currently working on my undergrad in history. And my focus is on the American Revolution and the founding of our nation. And when Hamilton wrote the Federalist Papers, the thing that he made very plain was for our democratic process to work. Everybody has to vote and everybody has to be educated. So I'm excited to see so many people in the crowd today coming out to learn about all of us. Uh, a little bit about my background. My wife and I have uh, 
been married for six years. We've been together for 12 years. She attended Salisbury University where we lived for about four years. We're both from Cecil County, born and raised. So we've been all over the Eastern Shore. We know people all up and down the shore and we know what it's like to live on the shore. So while Cecil County may seem like a far, you know, a couple hour drive from here, we go through the same things that everybody on the shore goes through. So the things that I'm focused on are making sure that our farmers have a voice at the table in Annapolis. Making sure that when legislation passed about our environment, about our environment is being passed, that our farmers are able to have a say, because no one is more of an environmentalist than our farmers. And they rely on a clean environment to be able to bring in good halls and good crops. I want to make sure that everybody has access to affordable health care, especially mental health care. My sister is transgendered, and she is a military veteran. And a couple months ago, she tried hanging herself from the Dell Memorial Bridge. I want to make sure that people like her never have to go through that, that they have resources available. I want to make sure that mental health care is available for all of our veterans, all of our students, all of our parents, all of our mothers, everybody has access to that. I want to make sure that all of our workers are being represented, that they have the right to unionize, that they are protecting the collective bargaining system, and that we can give them a living wage. I'm very excited to be here tonight, and I look forward to having you guys get to know me. Thank you. Me or Steve? You. you. Me? You. All right. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome for being, or welcome to, uh, I guess, the uh, League of Women Voters uh, Forum again this year, or this, e this fall. Um, thanks for having us, and uh, look forward to this evening. Um, my name is Jay Jacobs. I am uh, currently a delegate, House of Delegates. I'm seeking my third term. I am a fourth generation resident of Rock Hall, actually, in the Eastern Shore, and uh, come from a family of watermen and farmers. Uh, farmers on one, my mother's side and watermen on, the, on my father's. I always said I'm a purebred Eastern Shoreman. So uh, <clears throat> anyhow, I am the senior delegate, uh, one of two in the Eastern Shore, uh, specifically from the, from the Northern Shore. Uh, my colleague, the other uh, senior delegates from Southern Maryland at Somerset County. Uh, prior to uh, being elected in the House of Delegates, I served 14 years in local government, 12 of which I was the mayor of Rock Hall. Um, while, uh, actually between, while I was mayor and, and just before I was elected to the House of Delegates, I served on the Maryland Critical Areas Commission and uh, had to resign once I won this position in the House of Delegates. I've uh, served eight years on the uh, same committee, um, environment and transportation, eight years at Ag, sub, Ag and Natural Resources Subcommittee, also Transportation Subcommittee. I'm a member of Nutrient Management Advisory Board, Maryland Dairy Oversight uh, Commission. I'm the ranking member in uh, my committee, minority member. I'm the chair of the Minority Caucus, a small business owner. I have two daughters, three granddaughters, and uh, my wife Dawn is here with me this evening. So I look forward to this evening. Thank you. Good evening. I'm, I'm Delegate Steve Ahrens. I'm the resident delegate for Queen Anne's County, and I'm happy to be here. And I thank you all for putting on the forum here. Um, as I said, said before, it's pretty important that people actually get to hear us talk and get to hear us speak. And I think it's uh, paramount that you all take a hard look at us and, and review what we've, done, what we've done and what we've accomplished. I was your Queen Anne's County Commissioner for three years back uh, in 2010, and I was fortunate enough to get appointed to the House of Delegates after Senator Pipkin left. Um, and uh, Senator Hershey, then Delegate Hershey, moved up, and I, I moved into the, to the delegate position. I served that year on the Appropriations Committee, which was um, pretty interesting to get a little bit better understanding. I knew county government and what it did. I didn't really have a great understanding of how the state worked, but I come to find out that they had similar problems to what we had over here. Um, you've heard a lot of talk about uh, what we do over here and how we do it over here. I think it's important to note that our largest industry, the farms, um, I'll speak for my delegation on that. Each and every one of us was endorsed by the Farm Bureau, which is pretty important because that's the biggest thing, biggest product we offer over here. We also have been in, uh, endorsed by the uh, Maryland retailers, and if you look at the business in Queen Anne's County, we have a tremendously large amount of uh, retail associations out there. So we kind of look after our own. Um, I serve on the Economic Matters Committee at this point. I am the Deputy Minority Whip on that committee. 
Um, it's a leadership position in Annapolis, which gets me in the back room with some things to where we talk about legislation and all the, all the committees, the standing committees in, in Annapolis. I have a, a wife, two kids, both products of Queen Anne's County schools. One is a, in the honor school at uh, University of Maryland. My son's now a, a junior at, Queen, at Kent Island High School. I got 15 seconds left to talk about. Um, <laughs> any of you that have asked me for questions or looked at me or came to me for answers, I think you've all seen that, that I represent you well. Um, I got a comment made to me that I, I know you because I see your picture so much, and I said that's because we're out doing the work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is the part of the agenda I always like. It's where every, the audience gets to ask our candidates the questions. And first I'm going to go over a few of the, the ground rules. So when you do ask a question, we're gonna ask that you come up here and, and use this microphone. And then introduce yourself and tell us where you live. You'll have 45 seconds in order to pose your question. And again, the timer's here. We'll be letting you know when, when you run out of time. Um, please pose your question to one candidate. That candidate will then have one and a half minutes in order to respond. I'll then ask any of the opposing candidates if they're interested in also responding, and then each of those candidates will be provided with one minute to respond. So a couple of things about when asking your question. Please do not use this as an opportunity to address any kind of personal situations but rather ask questions that are of more general interest to the voting public. And then also, please refrain from providing any personal comments or opinions about the candidates or the issues. So, I mean, public exchanges such as this work best if there is a high level of civility and decorum. Um, so please, um, as we go through the questions and answers, please hold your applause, because um, the applause just kind of takes time away from our opportunity to ask um, questions. Um, so what I'd like to do then is ask um, any of our audience members to come up and um, ask questions. This question is for Ms. Woodward. And what is one action that could be taken right now to improve the health of the bay? Um, thank you for the question. Oh, I need the mic. Thank you for the question. Um, honestly, I think one immediate action that could be taken right now, today, to, the, to improve the health of the bay is um, to look at consumer plastics reduction. Uh, Reducing plastics is something that we can all do. Uh, my husband and I have participated in the Kent Island beach cleanups, and if you haven't done one of those yet, I encourage you to do it. You would not believe the plastics and trash that we've pulled out of the bay, everything from bottles and cans. We even pulled a pool cue out of the bay in its, in its case. I kid you not. But um, I really do think reducing plastics, um, Going back to my mantra of educate, negotiate, and legislate, I think one of the things we can do is to educate the public um, about the damage plastics are causing, to, causing the Bay. Um, I think we can provide guidance and tips on how to reduce our own personal uh, plastics consumption, simple things like um, taking reusable grocery bags to the grocery store. Um, uh, one of my personal favorites is uh, using a bamboo toothbrush, uh, refusing plastic straws in restaurants. Um, and on the negotiate part, I know that there have been um, citizens, at least in, in Queen Anne's County, and I believe Caroline County too, who have taken the initiative and gone to local restaurants to request that they refrain from offering plastic straws. And I know there are a couple of restaurants doing that, and I have to stop now. <laughs> okay, Mr. Ernst. Okay. You want to go first? Yep. Talk to you. Okay. okay. Um, you know, the uh, cleanliness of the bay is certainly important to, to all of us um, that live in Maryland, especially those who live here in, in District 36. I've been beating my fist on the table for eight years over the Conwingo Dam and, and the effects that, that uh, they have on specifically this district. Uh, this year we certainly saw another indication of 
how serious that problem is. It took forever to convince some of the groups, environmental groups, of the real significance of the problem, the fact that it was full. It's not holding back any nutrients anymore, heavy metals. It, you know, the only way to clean that out is, is through scouring, which is certainly not a way to do that. So we're working on different remedies now to, to address that. This year, we all got to see the debris throughout uh, the state of Maryland. I was happy to see it plug up Annapolis Harbor and help us in our calls actually to get the, the message very clearly out there. Another serious problem, and I've been on this for the eight years that I've been in Annapolis, is the seriousness of raw sewerage overflows into the Chesapeake Bay. And it is a continual problem. The number of, of documented discharges doesn't fluctuate much. The gallons do. This is going to be another big year. Um, there were 17 million gallons that came out of Baltimore City last year. We're probably past that right now. I haven't got the new numbers yet. But uh, it's a very serious problem that certainly affects us right here in this district. So it's something that's uh, very important to me. Thank you. I would have to agree with Delegate uh, Jacobs. Um, a couple of things that happened to us when we started looking at the em environmental groups, when they come in to vi visit us and meet with us as our caucus, we talk about the bay, the health of the bay. We talk about a couple areas in particular. One would be the Conowingo. I would say the, the biggest thing we could do to help that bay right now would be for the federal government to step up and actually work with us to handle Pennsylvania and New York and the pollution that they're providing to us in, in abundance. I think in one storm this year coming out of Baltimore Harbor, there were 8 million gallons gallons of human whatever that flowed over there. And in this, in this presentation we got, neither one of those was an issue. All they had marked were the farms on Kent Island and in Queen Anne's County. And we sat back and said, give me, a, give me just a guess. If, if we could fix 5% of the Conowingo, would that have any more of an impact than all of the farms doing something? And keep in mind, these farmers, they're doing the best they can with what they have. They do not deliberately put anything more on their, their fields that cost money because they're trying to make their, a living off of all that. I guess I got to stop. But there's so much more. Hold it right there. Nope. Hi, uh, my <clears throat> name is Amy Warner, and I'm a resident of Church Hill. So I have a question for Crystal Woodward. Crystal, um, you said in your opening remarks that you were going, you're um, concerned about bringing accessible health care to Marylanders. Um, would you please expand on what you said in your opening remarks about that? Thank you for the question. Um, first of all, I have to give kudos to the state of Maryland for expanding Medicaid. Um, but there's still a fight ahead of, ahead of us, a um, fight against rescinding the Affordable Care Act. And that's a huge concern of mine, um, both as a policymaker and as an advocate for people with diabetes, which of course is a pre-existing condition. Um, Right now, the, one of the, my main concerns is the cost of, of medication for seniors. We have seniors who are trying to get their insulin, trying to get their high cost, um, higher prescription cost drugs, and they haven't, um, many aren't able to do so. And again, it goes back to choosing whether to pay for your medication or you know, to pay your electric bill. Um, so I'm a big proponent of the Prescription Drug Affordability um, Board that um, is being explored right now. And that board, my understanding what that would do would be to look at the high cost of prescription drugs. Um, it would be also to look at the, the pharmacy chain, um, find out what's causing the cost of drugs to skyrocket so much. Um, is it the pharmacies? Is it the intermediate benefits manager? Um, but we have to make sure that people have access to health care. And I'm going to do all I can to continue to fight against the recension of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, again, thank you for the question. It's an excellent question. I think uh, it's of interest to note that Queen Anne's County, actually our 36th district, is the we represent the only two counties in this state that do not have a hospital. 
And I think that's, that's very big. Back when I was a commissioner, we, we became, through the, working with our delegation, we, we actually got inter interested party status with uh, the University of Maryland when they're, when they're trying to build a hospital in Easton. And we were able to bring so many services up to our emergency room up uh, in, in uh, Queen, Queenstown right here in, on Route 50. But the other thing is, is our, our delegation and through the help of the General Assembly, we've actually intervened in some of the process going on in Kent County with the removing of the hospital up there. And we've actually put a group together to study that, to try to bring health care and affordable health care to the rural counties. And it's not just a model for, for our area, it's a model for potentially the whole United States, but certainly all around um, Maryland. Um, as far as the studies and stuff that you were doing for um, prescriptions, that's something that we put into effect last year to put a put a study through to try to figure out why are these prescriptions so expensive and why are our seniors paying so much so there's a lot more to the to the prescription stuff I'm stopped thank you um, <clears throat> just to add uh, not to be redundant but just to add a little bit more uh, in my other hand when I was beating one with for Conowingo and my other one was uh, was some of the situation in uh, Chester River Hospital and uh, and what University of Maryland Shore Regional was, was trying to do in, in making that a freestanding facility and, and to eliminate inpatient services. So <clears throat> we were able, through uh, a lot of negotiations, to, to get legislation passed to create a rural health care commission, which I was a member of. Uh, Senator Hershey and I were both members of that. Uh, we, we spent nearly two years really looking and taking a comprehensive look at the challenges of health care on, in, on the Eastern Shore, and not just the Eastern Shore, but rural, Amer rural America. And I think this model will prove to be one that is, uh, would, be, would be a good model for any rural parts of America. We're, we're not finished with that. We've made, got some parts of it in place. We've got a key piece that needs to be passed this year that will really move that along. But I think we've been successful so far, at least, to keeping the inpatient services open. I think uh, much longer than Shore Region would would have liked. And I'll just add to what these gentlemen were saying. Again, I'm not going to repeat. Um, but some of the success stories that we've had in Carolina, in Carolina County, when you look at health outcomes, and I'm going to relate to that because I was a county commissioner for eight years there, and I and I know that health outcomes are very similar all across our entire district. Um, but there, uh, we used to comment that we're, we're first in a lot of things that we want to be last in, and we're last in a lot of things we want to be first in. And the challenge was was healthcare access. We didn't have urgent care. We didn't have. A, we don't have a hospital. There's not a hospital in Queen Anne's County. Um, so what what do we do? We're not going to sit back and just accept this as the status quo. What we did instead is uh, we partnered with uh, Shore Regional, and we also partnered our actually our biggest partner is Chop Ten Community Health, which is a federally qualified health center. Um, those guys, that organization, they're actually expanding, they're going to build a huge building in Denton. Um, this is an organization um, that has a lot of the benefits of uh, recruiting doctors, which is a big problem, recruiting uh, uh, primary care doctors. Uh, they can do tuition reimbursements where no one else can. Um, they actually, they, they don't turn anyone away. They're actually reimbursed by the federal government as well. Uh, they're in all of our schools, our school-based health care programs. Um, so they, they're actually involved. They're, they're in our community. Um, and they're, they're helping people who can't help themselves because when you talk about affordable health care or access to health care, it's the people who have the money have access. It's the people who don't have money. They're the ones that are, that are challenged. And, and uh, Chop 10 Community Health is a huge partner that I think they need to expand and they need to grow throughout the entire district. Good evening, delegates and candidate. This question is directed towards uh, Delegate Steve Ahrens. As your Queen Anne's County Sheriff, safe schools is my, which is our, top priority in our county. As a delegate, what is your position regarding the funding for school security and resource deputies? First of all, I, I think there's a caveat to that, and I appreciate the question, Sheriff. Um, one of the things we have to do is if we're going to fund these guys, we have to allow them to do their jobs. And I've noted in Queen Anne's County where they're not necessarily allowed to do their jobs. And there, there's some things that happen in the schools that we, we are not getting through it. I put a piece of software in in Queen Anne's County back when I was a commissioner called Text to Stop It. And that software is literally an anonymous text to allow people to say something's going on in school. And, and I find that a lot of that stuff is not going 
going any further than just the, the principal's office, and it's not getting to the sheriff. As far as funding this, I think one of our key components is we have to protect our kids. We have to be acknowledge our kids, but we also have to put accountability from the top down in that. We have to have better, better control of what's going on in the school. Um, the funding side of it, I would work heavily to do that. I think that um, it's sad that we need it. It's, it's sad that it's allowed to occur, but I do think that there needs to be accountability and people need to be responsible for, for some of their actions. Um, recently, um, I, I was told that a couple of kids, and this comes from a reliable source, that they stole some stuff out of gym bags in the school. And the principal decided that he's not going to use the police for this. He's going to handle it internally. Now, I don't know what message that sends to you, but it sends a very bad message to a son or a daughter that's sitting out there saying, you know what, you need accountability. Somebody needs to be punished for what they did. And I'm not saying you beat them up, you put them in jail, but I'm saying you, you bring somebody in there. I put legislation in a year or so ago that I, every time something happened with your child that would get you or me arrested, in school that I wanted the principal there, I wanted the uh, parent there, and I wanted the uh, at least the superintendent and re student resource officer. That, that legislation got so shot down because I was targeting these poor kids, which not, was not the intent. It was just to bring accountability to them. If they see somebody when they first get started on something, they're more apt to stop it. So I would, support, I would support extra dollars, and I think last year we did that within the General Assembly. We allocated extra dollars, over a million dollars, outside the budget for student resource officers. So I, I, I voted for that, but thank you. Would anyone else like to respond to that? I'll just be very quick and brief on this. Uh, yes, uh, school resource officers and school security, it's a priority not only for the governor, but also the General Assembly, all members of the General Assembly. Uh, and I can't imagine that uh, those priorities will change moving forward. So I, I would fully expect um, maybe even more money going to, into school security um, into the future, and I can't imagine anybody opposing that. So. Thank you. I'm Bob Simmons uh, uh, from here in Centerville, and I'm going to be addressing uh, my question to uh, to uh, Jeff Chris concerning uh, the Kerwin report. Uh, for those in the audience that may not know, the Kerwin Commission is a is a study commission that has been working for a year and a half of trying to see what the state needs to do to bring its education system up to an Nash international level, uh, not being 24th or 25th in nations like we are. Uh, and with that in mind, I would ask, uh, have you received as a uh, legislator sufficient information about what the, the, the commission is doing? And uh, how is your feeling about your support for it so far? Yeah, the Kerwin Commission has not reported back to the General Assembly yet. They're, they're, they're still meeting, and um, the, the purpose of that is that uh, the, uh, under the, uh, the previous funding formulas under Thornton, um, they realized that it, it, it didn't work across the entire state, so they're taking another look at uh, all the, the various funding formulas when it comes to the operating budget and, and, and um, in the schools. Now, I served on the Knott Commission, which uh, looked at uh, school construction funding, funding in the capital budget. Um, and so one of the things that, uh, and certainly we, we as, a, as a team, uh, we've had some input um, into the Kerwin formula um, as well, um, in, in particular uh, for uh, like vocational training. We want to make sure, especially on the Eastern Shore, um, that we're going to make sure that, uh, that it is a priority in both the, the uh, Kerwin formulas um, as well as uh, um, any of the recommendation that came out of the Knott Commission and the law that we actually passed last year. And we were successful in, in, in um, making sure that our, uh, um, our, our tech schools um, and our vocational um, investments uh, moving forward because there is a, a, a big uh, workforce uh, shortage here on the Eastern Shore and a real shortage on, uh, on uh, technical training. So that was a focus uh, for us as well. Um, just on that note, uh, I want to encourage you know, everybody to take a look at the lockbox uh, referendum on the ballot. And uh, I guess I'm not supposed to say how to vote on that because this is nonpartisan, but I hope you'll take a good, a good quick, uh, not quick, but a thorough look at it and, and vote accordingly. Um, with, with the Kerwin Commission, um, those recommendations, um, hopefully if the referendum gets approved um, and based on the Kerwin recommendations we will have 
uh, fairer, more attractive compensation for teachers. I'm special, especially interested in the, the vocational, the trade school aspect, because we certainly need a 21st century academy, um, not just in Queen Anne's County, but on the Eastern Shore, to really train these kids to be prepared for careers that are gonna enable them to prosper, careers in cyberspace, cyber security, coding for artificial intelligence, um, building wind turbines. Um, so I, I'm hopeful that the, um, the voters will look to vote yes on that amendment. First of all, uh, thank you, uh, Bob. I appreciate it. I worked with Bob and served with Bob back on the county commissioners. He was a, a great ally. Um, as far as the Kerwin Commission, I think you know you and I experienced this um, somewhere, somehow. The, the the mechanism that we're using today is broken, and it's not really serving the people well. And I do applaud Governor Hogan with the lockbox. I think that's a great great idea he came up with or put through. If you saw a lot of the things and a lot of the instances, and in, as far as the um, the state and where, where we've spent money and how we've taken money from, from different pots to pay the bills. I think that, that was a great idea. Um, I also appreciate some of the things we're doing on that. If, if they can actually start targeting and finding out why there's such a differentiator between schools like Baltimore City and Queen Anne's County and Caroline and look at the results and how we're achieving those. I think those are important things that they need to look at. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, I'm Marianne Greer. Uh, I have a very simple question. Um, I would like to know the stand, your stance on um, protecting the ban on automatic weapons going forward. Um, Mike Welker, I guess. <laughs> protecting the ban on automatic weapons going forward. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, I think Maryland has uh, pretty solid laws on gun control currently. Uh, this, last, uh, this last session, I believe we had three more major laws uh, go through to help with that. Uh, the key thing for protecting the ban on automatic weapons, uh, we need to make sure that we're watching where those weapons are coming from. A lot of times, weapons that we find in states that have tough laws are coming from out of state. So we need to find a way, the most efficient, cost-effective way to monitor where any sort of weapons are coming from. Uh, Recently, uh, we had in Aberdeen, Maryland, we had a shooting um, that was maybe 15, 20 minutes away from where I work. All of Perryville, all of Aberdeen were shut down while the police were looking for the person. We need to make sure that we also have uh, systems in place to help report when anything like that might happen, not just in schools, but in the workplaces. And then we need to make sure that when people are applying for a gun permit, that we know that these people are mentally sound because it came out in a report that that woman that did shoot the Rite Aid Distribution Center, that she did have some mental health problems and that really she probably shouldn't have been allowed to have that weapon. So we need to make sure that our laws enforce what's currently on the books and that we can find a way to protect people when they're applying for these licenses that if, if there's anything going on with them that we should probably investigate them first. That's, I mean, it's, I think it's a pretty simple answer. I think it's even more simple than that. I, it, it, the question had to do with uh, fully automatic weapons, um, and they're, essentially it's a federal law. You cannot buy or purchase or, or own a fully automatic weapon um, without getting, we're going through an, a, a very, very extensive federal process in order to be able to own one. And as far as I know, um, I don't know of anyone who's ever been successful. Um, so it's, it's, it's very, very heavily regulated at the federal level, fully automatic weapons. And I think, but maybe the question was AR-15s, which is a semi-automatic weapon. Uh, that that might be, may have been your question. But um, and if it is a semi-automatic weapon, which is an AR-15, um, there, there is no ban on that in the state of Maryland. Um, and um, there were no bills, at least over, that I'm aware of. Now, they, they go through the Judiciary Committee, um, so nothing's ever come out of the Judiciary Committee that would have had a ban on semi-automatic weapons, at least in the last four years since I've been there. And now, I'm simply gonna say they need to enforce the laws on the books as they stand right now. Yes, I was just gonna say that um, the three laws that were passed in session last year, um, they went into effect on Monday, so certainly we need to wait and see um, how those are enforced and then beef up the enforcement efforts. Um, recently, I heard from some parents, actually parents in Queen Anne's County, who were very concerned about the 
lack of consistency in safety policies for the schools. They are, this came from some elementary school parents, and I just want to raise it as an issue, an awareness issue, um, and make a case for the creation of consistent safety policies in the school. We have, from my understanding, is there's some elementary schools um, that lock all the doors. Um, you can only enter through the front. Um, there was a parent who was very distressed I talked to recently who she was able to enter through the rear entrance of the school with nobody questioning her. So my reason for saying that is really I think there is a need to um, develop consistent policies and also for communication between the parent, school, law enforcement. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Jim Wilson. I live in Kent Island. Queen Anne's County. Um, I have big concerns about the state of mental health uh, across the state, across the county. Um, and I also have major concerns about opioid addiction. Um, so I'd like to really start with Mr. Welker to have him talk about both of those. Um, what one thing can we do as a state to try and address the opioid problem with action, not just words. And then the same with respect to improving the mental health and things that we can do at the state level to improve that. Thank you. Uh, that is an excellent question. Um, I think Maryland, uh, recently we've seen all of these uh, medical marijuana dispensaries pop up. I know Cecil County, which has had two of them right on the Route 40 corridor. I think seeking alternative pain management methods like medical marijuana is a key way to combat this opioid crisis because these doctors are writing prescriptions for opioids like they're giving out candy. And we need to put a stop to that. We need to make sure that people who don't really need these opioids, <clears throat> they don't need to be getting them. Maybe we can get them to seek alternative methods like medical marijuana. Another big thing is it is tied very closely to the mental health. I, I think what we need to do is we need to target the problem at the root. We need to make sure that we're protecting our kids from this. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of students in high schools are trying these pills and then they end up getting hooked on them. And we need to make sure that in our schools that we have counselors available for our students. Not every school has a dedicated counselor. A lot of counties just have one counselor or two counselors that rotate between all the schools. We need to make sure that each school has their own dedicated counselor so that each student has access to that. So if we can give our students the mental health benefit of a counselor, we can recognize when they're at risk of getting hooked on these opioids, and we can prevent that from happening. Thank you. Uh, as far as the opioids, I, I think uh, I, I applaud Queen Anne's County for going purple. I think uh, the sheriff has been instrumental in that, along with the county commissioners. Um, I think that's, that's an extremely important step. Um, education is the key. Uh, these kids, they, they see stuff, their peer pressure is huge. I think accountability is something we need to be a little bit harder on. Um, today, I, we have the Good Samaritan Law where police officers uh, go out and administer Narcan. And the good news is, is people feel free to call on that. They feel free to use that because they don't want to see their friend die. The bad news is, is that um, it's an enabler. And I don't know how we're going to address that, but we need to start thinking out of the box and we need to start looking at other ways to attack this problem. And my big question is, are you mentally ill before you use drugs or after you use drugs? And, you know, with mental illness becoming paramount and huge, I mean, it's kept growing exponentially. We as a legislature are doing all we can to help facilitate some of these groups that actually have to provide these services to get accredited, to get their license, to get their things, to get their people in order. And, and that's huge when you start looking at it. Um, I think the past administration actually took away the Witsit Center up in... Uh, in Kent County, which was a, a, a rehab place for people, and we no longer have that. But we're working hard as, as a legislature to bring that back, and we recognize it's a serious issue. And the last thing I do want to say is there's so much more to some of these answers. If any of you have additional questions, I think we can go into greater detail one-on-one -on -one if you would care to. Thank you. I just want to chime in and say, um, you know, addiction is an illness. It's an illness. And with the opioid epidemic and addiction, Part of the key is medication assistance treatment. Um, it's not enough just to put an addict in rehab for 30 days, let him go, get out on the street again, 
gets arrested again, goes back into jail, and you know, it's a vicious cycle. So we really need um, to make sure that folks have access to not just treatment for 30 days, but really for a lifetime. And I think the best way to do that is to make sure that our health insurance, our Medicaid, health insurance will support those medications. And also, our health insurance will need to make sure and expand treatment for mental illness. Um, it, it all lies in the insurance coverage. So we need to make sure that we're covering those things with Medicare, Medicaid, and um, other insurance. Yeah, that's a very, very complicated question to a very, very complicated uh, problem. Um, and my simple answer, now there is no simple answer to this, because if there were, it wouldn't be a major complicated problem. It wouldn't be, that'd be affecting so many lives on the Eastern Shore and across the entire country. Um, but the simple answer is, is we're, we've done a lot already. We as a community, we as a country, we as a state have done an awful lot already. Um, it's not as easy now um, to prescribe um, opioid prescriptions. It's, it's, they, they, it's actually a database out there now that actually tracks every single prescription that's being, so that, that, th those bills have already been passed. We've already gotten beyond that. Now we just have to support. We have a great mental health uh, community right here on the Eastern Shore. Amazing, we have, Terry's right there, she's, a, she's part of it, you know, and we have to support these folks. They, they have the ideas, it, it's, it's trial and error. That's where we are now, what's working, what's not working. Let's continue supporting the things that work, and if it's not working, let's try something else. We have great law enforcement who's getting drugs off the streets. We had, there was a huge bust up in uh, uh, Cecil County just, this, uh, just the last few days. We have to support our law enforcement officers to get these drugs off the streets. We have to support, I talked about Chop Tank Community Health, a federally qualified health center. Um, let's, let's, that's a great answer um, that we had as far as getting mental health uh, support services in our schools. Let, let's, let's support everything that's happening right now. And, and, and again, it's trial and error, and, and, and we just have to, and, and there is hope. I hate to use the word hope for anything because you want to be in control. Um, but the only thing you can control is supporting the things that work and change the things that don't work. Thank you. Um, one, one thing I want to mention is the 36th delegation has, has really supported mental health in the Midshore for, for every year that I've been there. We've, we've certainly met with them on a regular basis, been educated by them on a regular basis, which is uh, something that we all need and have really been proud of what they've been able to do with very little resource. I always said they should be in charge of the state budget because they can squeeze a, a dollar and a half out of a dollar. So they, they're amazing. What I'm, and, and the Rural Health Care Commission, and when we met for the past two years, really identified a lot of areas that will, I think, lead to improvements in mental health, uh, how it's, how it's the, the places and, and and the uh, opportunities throughout the shore. Uh, the other thing is in the opioid, the uh, going purple has really been outstanding. To listen to some of these commercials you hear on TV, I think are really important. For a person who's had taken opioids for two days, and all of a sudden they talk about the symptoms they're feeling and withdrawal, because it, that's about all it takes. To understand the average person, you know, you instantly think about the addict, but it's it's the person who's gets on them really easily that is starting to get this education, which is paramount to understand that's how quick and serious and how addictive these painkillers are. It's not just heroin. It's, it's, it's a lot of, of uh, drugs that really lead to heroin uh, at, at the end result, and now the fentanyl issue on top of that. So um, you know, I think it's something that we all care a great deal about. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Mike Garns. I live uh, in Chester on Kent Island. Um, I stood up to ask a question just because of the um, opioid uh, issue that just came up. Uh, and Delegate Aarons uh, mentioned the Whitsitt Center in Chestertown. Um, I happen to know that uh, you know that an issue there is there's a w an empty wing of that center that's not being used at the moment. Um, you mentioned uh, giving Narcan to f young folks who have overdosed and bring them back to life, but they you know, just let them go. And they just let them go because there's no facility for them to go to rehab. So my question is, what can any of you do? This question is for the whole panel. 
Okay, I'll give it to Delegate Aarons then, uh, since he brought it up. Uh, what can you do to get that particular uh, center reopened for uh, addiction rehab and expanding beyond that? We, we definitely need the education you're talking about. We need to convince these young folks that uh, they're essentially playing Russian roulette, but uh, for the ones that need rehab, there's just no resources here. And what can we do to change that? Thank you for the question. Actually, we do have we do have resources. If we just don't have enough resources, and I think that if you if you look around us, this this problem we have is growing exponentially. It's growing far faster than the Whitsitt Center could could possibly handle it. Um, that that piece was taken away. I think what six eight years ago. Nine years ago, the Whitson Center went away, and since that time, we've been lobbying to get something back there, to put something back there. We actually utilize that. Um, OMS is starting to utilize that for certain pieces of, of, of the problem that we're addressing, but we need more. And by saying we need more, we need to stop it because it's overrunning what we had. If we were to gauge and build today to address what we have today, tomorrow we won't have enough. And that is where the whole opioid crisis part comes into play in the education and stopping this and finding a way to finalize this. Um, I, was, I worked with the uh, Anne Arundel Medical Center on some things to sit back and get the accountability for these drugs. I went in with a back problem one time and I ended up going back saying, you know what, this one didn't work. And so they gave me 20 more of another one, and that didn't work, so they gave me 20 more of another one. So I'm sitting around with 50-some pills in my house that are, are narcotics, and I have a 17, at the time I had a 13, and I had a 17-year-old child. That's not an enviable position. So they went in and are actually tracking that. I mean, those things are working, where these places are actually sitting down saying, if one doctor gives it to you over here, you can go to another doctor and they can track you. Um, my, with all due respect, uh, we're working hard at it. It's just bigger than we are right now, and I think a lot more needs to be done. Thank you. Um, I think it was nine years ago it was closed. I remember I was mayor and I was part of an all-night vigil with Senator Pipkin and uh, then Delegate Smeagol. We we've spent all night, 24 hours vigil and, and just in awareness of that. I've actually put legislation in to, to reopen Upper Shore uh, Mental Hospital and uh, did not get the support from various agencies that I felt should have been done. Um, we have been able to expand the, the AF Witsit, you know, the rooms there. There has been detox units added, which is critical in addiction. Uh, and thankfully, the Governor Hogan, I think, put $800,000 in there a couple of years, last year, I believe it was to address these issues. So we're making progress. But I've got, I got a call well, a week or so ago about there's still room, there's still room to expand that. Um, you know, the 21 days is not enough time for rehabilitation in, in, in the kind of drugs that are going around now, and we could certainly use more space. So something I think that's ongoing and that we're gonna work, uh, continue to work to uh, try and get the full capacity of that building in, in a area that's really much needed in not just the uh, 36th district, but uh, Talbot County as well. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, uh, we have one more question, and then after that, I'm gonna take the liberty of asking a question, and I think that will be it for this evening, because we're getting, um, getting a little bit late. Good evening, candidates. My name is Sue Wilson, and I live in Stevensville in Queen Anne's County. And I'm going to switch, switch gears a little bit, still about the health, but maybe the health of the environment. Um, I know a little bit about the Clean Energy Jobs Act, and I'd like to direct the question to Crystal Woodward. Um, do you support the Clean Energy Jobs Act? Um, and this act would increase renewable electricity in Maryland to 50% by 2030. And if you would support that, would you explain why? Thank you for the question. Thank you for the question. It's an excellent question. And um, I definitely do support the Clean Energy Job Act. I, I support a transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy um, to reduce the carbon footprint, um, to overall make the environment healthier, to help the economy prosper and to create jobs. I mean, solar, uh, 
wind turbines, that's where the jobs are, that's where the energy is gonna be in the future. Um, I know, my, it's my understanding, I believe, um, I don't, I don't know, if, know if it's Kent or County, I wanna say it's Kent County, that there are some solar projects and products now being made in Kent County. Um, it has created about, my understanding is about 900 jobs in Kent County, and, and that's a good thing. Um, to do this transition, of course, there's going to be a cost associated with that. Um, from everything that I've read, and I'm not an expert on this, I admit that I'm learning. Um, from everything that I've read, um, the cost of renewable energy to the average Marylander uh, would be less than a cup of coffee. Um, it would be uh, savings of probably about five dollars a month on energy and I I just feel like if we don't pay a little bit now we're gonna have to pay a lot later with rising tides and climate change so I definitely am a proponent of the Clean Energy Jobs Act thank you for your question can I address it? Um, thank you for a question. It's an excellent question. I'll, I'll tell you what, clean energy is is huge. It's it's something that we're all looking at. But I, I think that when you start digging into this subject, there's so much more to it than just having clean energy. When you have clean energy, what it brings to you, it does bring jobs. It doesn't bring the jobs that we hoped it would bring. When they talk about building the turbines offshore, those bring jobs that are not necessarily Maryland jobs, but those jobs are temporary. They build the stuff and then they go away, and then we have maintenance jobs, which aren't bad jobs. The other side of it is is that these are not minor details and we start looking at it and I think everybody would support clean energy except that Queen I mean uh, Maryland cannot produce what they require. That means we are buying energy from out of state at a premium to some 18 to 20 million dollars we're paying in a premium to get electricity that isn't necessarily clean electricity. It's electricity we're having to buy because that's the credits we have to do. But I think in, in fairness, as soon as this, we subsidize every one of them. We subsidize uh, solar, we subsidize wind, and when they can start bringing it in line and let these people co be competitive, you can see solar's growing and getting better. It's, it's actually coming more and more cost effective but it's still not cost effective and I do agree that we do there is a price to pay for this and I think we should pay a, a price but the premium is way too high and the job market we are losing and jobs jobs are not taken we will not even take clean energy like natural gas and that can't even be part of this 50 percent so again thank you for your question um, did you want to go ahead first yes. well certainly we have goals we have to reach in uh, renewable energy and uh, you know, I'm, I'm certainly a proponent of good, sensible, renewable energy. What is concerning to us in this district is the reduction of, of productive farmland being taken out for solar farms, um, which is very concerning. I don't think that, that most people are not opposed to that idea, but they're opposed to the idea of taking out it's, it's, it's a very divisional thing, this, this uh, taking out productive farmland. So they, they've got to find areas that are not, that would be better locations, I think, without taking productive farmland out of operation. And there are a lot of companies that are targeting this district. We're getting targeted here because of the, the price of land. And uh, this is an ag-rich uh, district, and uh, it's very concerning the amount of efforts that are being put into this by companies to, uh, you know, to, to put additional uh, solar farms here. So it's something that we have to be very, very much uh, aware of from uh, county government level, state government level, et cetera. Thank you. Now, for full disclosure, I don't sit on that committee, so I haven't heard the testimony on either side of that bill. But what I do know, um, at least with my experience here locally, is that um, to produce about 300 megawatts of power, you're going to need over 2,000 acres of solar panels. 300 megawatts is hardly anything, to be quite honest. And in order to produce 300 megawatts, you're going to need over 2,000 acres of land in order to build uh, solar panels. And I did the math, and it's something like two and a half uh, miles by about eight miles long. Um, and now that's contiguous. Now, if you're going to do that on the eastern shore, it's not going to be contiguous. When you start buying up parcels all over the place, it's going to be even more spread out than that. Um, and 50% just seems like an arbitrary number to me, uh, to be quite honest. So we don't know what the cost would be um, to be, and 
part of the reason why we don't know what the well we don't know what the cost is, and then that's assuming whatever cost that we're we're going to assume would, would be under the current circumstances where we have the federal government subsidizing both um, solar and wind. And if you were to take that federal subsidy out, I think the game's over because you're not going to find anyone investing in solar uh, because it it won't pay for itself, um, and you would have a hard time uh, finding land because right now they're they're paying twelve hundred dollars an acre. Um, for solar, these guys coming up from Texas um, in order to be able to get this land and rent it, and now they're renting it um, to farm. They're only getting about two hundred seventy-five dollars an acre for uh, for irrigated land. So, if it's not subsidized, that game's over anyway. So it won't matter. Um, I do support the the plan. I remember I, I'm president of the Cecil County Democrat Club, and I remember they came to us about a year and a half ago. And said, "This is our plan. We want you guys to endorse us." This kind of Democrat club voted unanimously, we're gonna endorse this plan. But the other thing to consider with alternative energy is how effective it is, what can we consume and what do we need? Because during peak hours, there's no way that our current system of alternative energy can support us during peak hours. That's when people are at work during the week, when people are at home during the weekend, not at nighttime when we're all asleep, that's peak hours. So what we need to do then is we need to work with private companies, we need to say, hey, can you guys help us with this? Can we offer any sort of subsidies? Some counties have subsidies available for people who want to put solar panels on their roofs. That's a great thing for us to have. But like you said, federal government needs to help us step in with that. There's no way the state can handle this on our own. So if we can work with the federal government to make sure that we can subsidize this, I think it can really work. But we need to look at alternative ways other than massive solar farms or massive windmills. We need to get them on individual homes. Thank you. Good, well thank you everyone. Um, I was also going to ask about renewable energy, but I think your responses to the previous question <laughs> covered all my issues. Um, so what I'd like to do now is um, have each of the candidates give a, a one-minute closing comment, and we're going to do a reverse order. So it's going to be uh, Mr. Ahrens, followed by Mr. Jacobs, and around that direction. I make this a quick one minute for you. First of all, I really appreciate y'all having us here. I think uh, hopefully you all have seen that um, the questions you answered, I think, uh, and I'll speak for the delegation right now because I've, I work with these guys, we're informed. We really do have a handle on what's going on in the state. We understand the problems. We've confronted the problems and we're working on problems continuously. Um, we are a minority party in Annapolis. We have ideas, they have ideas, and we work together on a lot of these things. Um, I appreciate the fact that uh, you've given me a, the opportunity to serve you all, and I'm asking for your vote again. And I, I, I think this job is a lot more than just what we talked about tonight. The, the job does involve constituent services and the things we do for our people. We don't just handle laws and, and the rules. We actually work with people throughout our district on issues they have with their land, with their home, with their policing, with uh, personal issues and what have you. We all with, with MVA, but there's a lot more to this job than just going over there and putting a bill in and fighting a bill. Um, I believe we're the voice of reason over there because we, we really have to fight and chew for every piece we get. And thank you, and I'm asking you for your vote in November, and I hope I get it. Thank you very much. Am I next? Yes. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks for being here this evening. Everybody stayed till the end. That's, that's a good thing. Um, <clears throat> no one fell asleep. <laughs> no one fell asleep. Uh, I think it's a, a very important time in, in uh, in, in government right now. You know, it's it's very tense time. Uh, I'm proud of what we've been able to do at the state level. I think we've been a model for a lot of the rest of the country, how a, a, an, a, a body can produce what we're meant to produce in a very civil way without, uh, you, you just don't hear the problems at the state of Maryland uh, that you hear in other places. So I think that we've done a great job 36th delegation is a team that gets along well. We, we're, uh, we're all in different committees. We're a good blend. We've done a great job, I feel, for the 36th district. And uh, hopefully, you know, we'll be able to continue to do that. Uh, my position as a ranking member on the shore is real important because the, the longer, you know, you need some seniority in there in order to move up and, uh, and get a stronger voice. And I've been able to do that. I think another term, I'd be in a much better position to uh, even even be a, a better voice. So hopefully, uh, you'll see it that way and vote for me. Uh, won't be long, a couple weeks, I believe. <laughs> if you have any questions, um, we'll be around and give you a card or give you a number of contact information. It's it's hard to answer a good 
a good question in uh, 30 minutes, or thir a minute, a uh, minute and 30 seconds. Thank you. Uh, again, thank you for having us here. Uh, these kinds of forums are exciting because it's such a pivotal process for our, our, our democratic process in our nation. And we've heard a lot of great ideas up here. We've had a lot of awesome questions. And I think when you look at all of us up here, what we want is the same thing. We want Maryland to be the best state that it can be. We just may differ a little bit on how we get there. Um, so I, I want to thank all these guys for, for being here tonight. And uh, thank you guys for, for having all of us. Um, we're, it's a month from Saturday, the election. And this is going to be a crucial election for all of us because it's not only are these seats up for grabs, our governor's house is up for grabs. We have a Senate seat up for grabs. We have House uh, and Congress up for grabs. This is a crucial election for us, and I want to encourage, I'm sure all of you that are here tonight will be at the polls, but I want you to encourage all of the young people that you know to also get out there. We need to make sure that we get the youth vote. We need to make sure that we get our young people engaged in our process. Thank you. The, uh, it's, this has been a pretty good experience. And, and what it might take away here, um, and a priority for you all, is that uh, the environment's a big issue, um, which we're certainly taking note in, in mental health and behavioral health. And I appreciate you all coming out and certainly asking those questions and ex expressing your concerns. Um, and I say that because there is a big difference between Annapolis and D.C. Um, Annapolis isn't nearly as partisan as, as D.C. is. Um, it, we're, and it doesn't matter whether you're Republican, Independent, or Democrat, and you're in the House of Delegates or the, or the Senate. Um, you're there to problem solve. Um, we're your agent um, in Annapolis. So I would encourage you all on a consistent basis. It doesn't matter. We represent everyone, re Republicans and Democrats. Uh, and it doesn't matter what your party affiliation is. We're your agent. Uh, so please uh, stay in contact. Please uh, communicate with us what your priorities are uh, moving forward. And, um, and actually, that's the most rewarding part of, of my job. And I started off by uh, talking about uh, why I ran for delegate in the first place. And I've done an, uh, the, the first four years or the last four years that I've had um, in the House of Delegates, it, it takes time to establish relationships and build traction and earn respect. And I've done that. And so I'm going to ask you um, to allow me to serve at least a second term so I can build um, on that respect that, that I've been able to establish over the last four years and, and those religious relationships that I've built. So I'm just asking for your vote. Thank you. Thanks again to the League and thanks to everyone coming tonight, who came here tonight. Um, I've been working really hard to earn your vote. Hopefully you'll send me to Annapolis. I really think it's time for a little diversity and different thinking in Annapolis. Um, I'm not a professional politician. I'm not wealthy. I'm just a mom. Well, I shouldn't say just a mom. <laughs> I'm a mom. I'm a wife. I'm a daughter. I'm a sister. I'm an ordinary person who wants to work hard for the working families of Maryland, for the ordinary folks in Maryland. Um, I really, there's a comment. I think Jeff said something about, um, I'm not sure, the Eastern Shore being viewed as a minority. Um, and not really given the um, elevation and importance um, it deserves on level with other um, more urban counties. And I would like to go to try to change that. Um, if you'll let me, if, I, if you give me the privilege of serving in Annapolis, I will do my best to bring that shore voice to Annapolis. Thank you. So, so before I bring um, this evening's event to closure, I wanted to see if um, Heather Sinclair is here. Okay, Heather is in the, in the back row, wave your hand. Um, if you recall, our president uh, said earlier that we were not able to hold the, um, the forum for the um, state senate position because one of our candidates was not able to attend. So I encourage you all, she's uh, willing to stay for a little while you know, after this event, it, um, you're free to... Um, spend some time and talk with her. So um, I would like to, well, let me first, everyone here, thank you for coming. Um, it shows that you really do care about government and how our government runs and the candidates. So we do appreciate you rushing out of the house either before or after dinner and, and coming to join us. But please, um, let's all give our candidates a, a big hand and thank you. Thank you.